I have a story to tell. This story has been living with me for many years. It is a story for all of us because it is rooted in our national security mission. It is a story about families, love and loss, tragedy and hope. And it is a story about workers. My story begins at a time when the world was frozen by fear. After the war, Germany was divided into sectors which were occupied by the victorious powers. The Soviet Union had the largest sector of Germany, which included Berlin, but Berlin was an open city. And so you had Westerners there, people who, who were living in East Germany could come and go as they pleased in Berlin. Now, Stalin didn't like Westerners in Berlin. He didn't like having to share that city in the middle of his occupation zone. He didn't want to start World War III either. So he thought, well, I'm just going to lock people out. I'm going to impose a blockade. So when the Westerners, when their supply trucks show up at the checkpoint to come into our zone, we're not gonna let them through. So tensions are starting to rise with the Soviet Union. During the uh, Cold War, there was, uh, first the United States took comfort in the fact that we had nuclear weapons as a hedge against the uh, overwhelming uh, Soviet land forces, but when they uh, fired their first weapon, which looked just like our first weapon, uh, in 1949, uh, uh, the United States uh, realized that we were in a, in a race with, uh, uh, with the Soviet Union. People forget now that Khrushchev had Pounding this shoe on the podium at the UN, telling them there's, we, we, we will bury you, we will bury you. you know, everybody's looking back now with 2020 hindsight, but in those days, the laboratory was the technology front line, or the front line in the technology part of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And people were proud to work at the laboratory because it was, there was a patriotic element to it. You were defending the United States of America by working at the laboratory. The Russians were threatening <laughs> us, you know. Uh, you can think of some of the, like I said, some of the speeches that Khrushchev and others made, uh, there was a serious, there was some serious differences of opinion there. The country, of course, was under pressure, I guess is the good way to put it, because there existed a, a animosity, I think is a good word, between us and the Russian, and the USSR, to be distinguished. And they were working on nuclear weapons, we were working on nuclear weapons, they were working on rocket propulsion, we were working on rocket propulsion, and so there was quite a bit of competition, both to get uh, more precise rocket systems, smaller nuclear weapons with more energy in them, the, the more bang for the buck, as it was referred to. Those were very different times for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, to start with, World War II, people still remembered World War II. People still remembered that it was possible to have a war that claimed 60 to 80 million lives just using conventional weapons. And so the whole thought of World War III was very much at the fore of, of many people's minds. And so as to where World War II was history's deadliest war, the Cold War was history's most dangerous war. So there was a certain amount of pressure which had been carried over from World War II of we're working on weapons 
to defend the United States against military aggression by countries who have the capability, now in this case it's the Russians, who are supporting the Chinese, who are supporting the North Koreans, that we have to compete one-on-one -on -one with the Russians. It was called the Cold War, and it really started with the Korean War. And this is where the laboratory was a national resource in that Cold War struggle. So it was a source of pride to work at the laboratory. And I think there was a lot of pressure by everybody who worked at the laboratory that yes, we were in fact uh, frontline defense of the federal government. World War II veterans from north central New Mexico returned home to a changed world. The project on the hill was no longer a secret. Rather than depending on the local farms and orchards to make a living or moving out of state to find work, many people from cities and villages like Santa Fe, Santa Cruz, El Rancho, Española, Velarde, Chimayo, and El Huique became laborers at the growing Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. These men and women were making their way up the hill every day to work at a laboratory that was changing world history. So there's a road not far from where we are here, um, where we are now here in the Pueblo, um, and that was the original road. So it ran through El Rancho um, before State Road, State Road 4, then Highway 502 was constructed. Um, that was the main road to Los Alamos. There's also a split in that road um, when you, after you cross the, the bridge, Ottawa Crossing, Ottawa Bridge, um, and you get to the point where you're starting to make that curve, curvature, that road up to the Pajarito Plateau, um, the locals would actually call that also El Camino de la Culebra, um, which is basically Snake Road um, because of the multiple winds in the road. And when the final road was built later, m many years later, um, it reduced it by almost half those turns, that curvature. Prior to the laboratory, life was a struggle in northern New Mexico. You know, my grandfather, great-grandfather, these folks, you know, there was, it, was, it was a subsistence farming. You know, they'd grow crops and then they'd take them to the local uh, mercantile store or wherever and trade, sell their apples or their chili or whatever, or exchange them for uh, goods that they could, you know, sugar, coffee, tobacco, uh, you know, uh, clothing. That, you know, they couldn't make themselves. And so for them, uh, Los Alamos is an economic, uh, the economic impact of Los Alamos was, was important. So it's really interesting the way that the workers from the valley would go up to Los Alamos. Um, the men specifically were day laborers during that time. And it's interesting because it almost follows um, what would be similarly seen today as like the braceros, the workers, um, the Latin American Mexicano workers who are loaded into these trucks and then taken, or buses, and taken to their workspace. Um, that was exactly what was being done, although not from a farther distance, it was much closer here. So they would be loaded into these buses and taken up to the hill. They would work their day's work and they would, as laborers, blue collared workers, and then they would return to their communities in the evening. The women were a little bit different because a lot of the women worked there, um, but they stayed with families during the week. Um, some of the scientists' families or you know, other pers scientific personnel who worked up there full time. And so the women, a lot of them were housekeepers or babysitters. You were able to earn a salary and you earned cash and it, it resulted in a very different lifestyle that had been the case before. And I'm not inclined to necessarily believe that lifestyle was uh, was uh, inherently better, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily a carencia. There was some real struggling going on to survive in Northern New Mexico, whether you're Hispanic, Native American, or so-called Anglo. The people of the local pueblos were also a very important part of the laboratory workforce. has a lot of meaning. It's about history. It's about sacredness, respect. My mom worked at the lab. 
she was a housemate there. And they used to pick Pueblo members under the big tree in a green bus. And they always carried their badge and there's a east gate, I believe they call. It was up on top of Los Alamos, on top of the plateau, up in Guaya, top of the mesa. So they're on, they're escorted. But mom and some of the community members that work on the hill, they really didn't stay there. They commute to that bus, that green bus every day. The jobs also began to shift later as people from the valley went off to college, became educated, more educated with degrees and came back and began working um, different types of jobs, not specifically or not only the laboring positions. Um, then I think they saw it as something different um, they were enticed by hazard pay at a certain point. Um, so even when they knew that they were doing something um, hazardous or dangerous, they also saw the opportunity to be compensated for what they were doing. When Atomic Energy took over the land on top of the plateau, we probably didn't really have that type of control. Being a tribal member and talking to my grandma, grandparents, tribal members, they were so happy about working up their employment opportunity, you know. I think bringing food to the community, it's about work experience, on the job training, community service employment. Some of our tribal members actually did seek uh, higher education in their early days. So they did go beyond high school, but in the earlier days, normally you will probably find any one of our parents or grandparents that uh, probably only went up to maybe fifth grade or sixth grade, and because all they needed them at home to do a lot of the chores, a lot of the farming and the stuff like that. But as time went on and Los Alamos became more, I guess, apparent, uh, more of our people started telling our, our kids to go go through education, finish high school, go, go to Los Alamos, get, get a job up there. And that's been encouraged. And, and as of today, as we're speaking, we still encourage that as well as to have our younger kids to go to higher education, go to college, and get an education and come back or, or go to Los Alamos, get, find an internship for, for, you, for, you, for them to come back to. raised in Valarde, New Mexico, which is about 37 miles, 37 miles uh, north of here on the way to Taos. And, uh, and my trip up, my commute to Los Alamos, which I did for many years, of course, was more like a ride in a time capsule than it was a commute involving 37 miles. I, as I commuted up here, every morning I drive past an irrigation ditch that had been in continuous use since about 1599, the year after my European ancestors came to New Mexico, and uh, drove through three Native American reservations whose occupants had been here since the beginning of time, since the earth cooled for all practical purposes, and within 45 to 50 minutes, depending on the traffic, I was working at an institution that changed the course of world history. You also had some families that moved from the valley to Los Alamos. My grandparents on my mother's side were one of those families. So my mother, when she was born, she was actually, my grandparents were actually living in Los Alamos at the time. And my grandma told my grandpa that she wouldn't move back into the valley unless they had running water like they had in Los Alamos. So, so some of the families were living um, in Los Alamos even before the gates opened in 1957. It's always about partnership, about transparency, how we can work together, how we can make things better for our community. And today to continue to work with them because a lot of what goes on the lab is very confidential. The lab has given us this opportunity. You know, some of our youth, young adults have retired from there, you know. They work for many years and it's a blessing, you know. Uh, some see it in a different perspective, you know, but again, uh, it's a blessing 
the employment opportunities available. One area of the lab that needed hundreds of workers was called S-Site. It was the hub for high explosives operations, including casting, pressing, machining, transporting, and burning high explosives. The Cold War frenzy called for two and sometimes three shifts per day to process over 100,000 pounds per month of high explosives. At its peak, the laboratory designed and the military deployed over 30,000 nuclear weapons. In the late 50s, we began to look for, again, a higher energy explosive, which was what was wanted. Uh, and a RDX and HMX powder was coated with a plastic and then that plastic was put in a press and pressed to create a high density solid material. And of course with almost any development when you introduce a, a new material or a new process, you introduce safety problems that you weren't aware of ahead of time. Like many men from the valley, Jose Cordoba, Escolástico Martinez, Severo Lujan, and Leopoldo Pacheco worked at S-Site. Mabel Cordoba packed a lunch for her husband each morning. He walked to the end of the dirt road to catch the carpool to begin the journey across Añate Bridge in Española. Other workers drove through San Ildefonso Pueblo lands and crossed the Rio Grande near the former site of Ottawa train station. The two routes coalesced into a single parade of cars to make the ascent up the windy Main Hill Road, past the administrative offices of the laboratory to a remote area just short of the back gate. On October 14, 1959, these four men were assigned to work together on an explosives scrap disposal crew. The best way to treat this type of waste was and is to burn it. Burning operations had begun at Los Alamos in the 1940s. Each of these four men had approximately 10 years of experience in the explosives area. Although they would be following a familiar route to conduct a routine operation, a formal written and approved procedure did not yet exist. A draft procedure had been prepared this move to greater formality was in response to an explosive machine accident that had killed two men earlier that same year. On this October day, a special request was made to pick up a very large piece of PBX 9404 from Building 261. After lunch that day, they began their pickup routine. Martinez and Lujan were driving a two-ton explosives truck, while Pacheco and Cordoba were in a half-ton Dodge panel truck. Their first stop was V-Site, where they picked up several empty waste cans that they would use to replace the full ones they were about to pick up. Their route included buildings 380, 223, and 300. At each of these stops, they picked up a variety of explosive waste materials and loaded them onto their truck. In addition, they were instructed to stop at Building 261 to pick up a large hemisphere of PBX 9404 that weighed 104 pounds. Their total load that day was approximately 300 pounds, still far below the maximum weight limit. Then they continued their route onto the burning ground. As these men were performing their duties, on the other side of the world, the Soviet Union was developing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we knew right away in 1953 when they set off a uh, bomb that it was a thermonuclear bomb. And uh, this was the year before we tried uh, the solid fuel in the castle test series in 54. And, uh, so uh, uh, 
there was no question that we were in a technological race with the, uh, with the Soviets. 12 August 1953. Maybe we're not as far as behind, maybe we're even ahead. Well, 1953 rolls around and the Soviets test a deliverable thermonuclear weapon. How did they do this so fast again? You know, how did they just keep answering? Uh, and, and so the Soviets, it looks like they've regained the lead. They've got a capability we don't have. We couldn't deliver a hydrogen bomb in combat in 1953. And so here at the laboratory, that was, the, that was the, the, the big priority. We've got to make a deliverable hydrogen bomb as fast as we can. And so, of course, again, work cranks right back up at S site, although it never really stopped. We, we, and so what they were trying to do was develop emergency capability weapons. These were hydrogen bombs that were not very refined. They, some, uh, you know, these things were really big, very heavy, very unwieldy. But the goal was, it's got to be a bomb. It's got to be something we can put on a plane and deliver. There was a, people who, of course, down, uh, wrote down the Russian knowledge and evidence has shown they're as smart as we are. Uh, Joseph Stalin had, uh, had died in 1953. He was still very fresh in people's memory. Uh, most people who have done academic studies of the Soviet Union estimate that Stalin killed about 20 million of his own people. That was the enemy. Okay, and so this was very much something worth fighting for. You know, it was just this back and forth with the Soviet Union. We can't let the Soviets have a capability that we cannot match or exceed. Now, the president says, says that, right? Who makes good on it? Los Alamos. Los Alamos makes good on it. And that's how it was back in those days. No, you won't speak, and I won't speak, that's true. Two stubborn people with a cold war to go through. This site was a special place to work. And so the fact that you were working in a, uh, quote, secret environment, with hazardous materials like high explosives, I think was a source of pride for my father and for a lot of the men I knew who worked out at a site as, at that time and to this day. There's something special about working on high explosives. A site is one of those special areas at the laboratory. It's got a history that goes all the way back to World War II. A lot of the sites out in that area, the back 40, if you will, they have letter designations. Usually that letter stands for something, and in the case of S site, it stands for sawmill. And so there was uh, a more or less portable sawmill operation going on out there before the government came to town during the Manhattan Project. And so it became S site, the saw, where the sawmill was. And that's how it got its name. Well, there was competition within the laboratory, no question about that in research areas. But there was also a, a, a target in each case, and that was the development of a, of a new weapon system. There was that driving force which put everybody together. The, the, there was a lot of work going on, and it was fast, and the stakes were very high. And I remember talking to, you know, my dad works at that site. Oh, really? Okay. And that, you knew what that meant as a kid. Or my uncle works there, or whatever, or my... My dad works at Los Alamos. I don't know. There, were, there, was, there was something special about that. I just can't stand another cold, cold war with you. Martinez and Lujan arrived at the burning ground. They unlocked and opened the gate and then backed the explosives truck onto the gravel pad and stopped. 
Pacheco and Cordoba stopped at Barricade 395 to pick up the materials for igniting the burn. Then they drove toward the burn pad, parked outside the fence, and joined the others. What was your morning like on October 14, 1959, when you went to work? Well, when I went to work at about 9.30 in the morning, Dad came by and gave me some pinions. And he looked awful pale at the time, okay? And I remember him walking out. Wait just a minute. And then that, that morning, they, we, uh, they loaded up the uh, explosives in the truck and they took off. The morning of Wednesday, October 14, 1959, Dawn like any other autumn day in north central New Mexico. Some preparations had already been made at the burning ground for the burn that was to take place that day. When they arrived at the burning ground, they backed the truck onto the gravel surface to begin to unload the truck. Mr. Pacheco was over checking on the wet machining scrap to see if it was dry. And the two youngest men began to unload the delivery truck. Mr. Cordoba and Mr. Martinez. Mr. Lujan, it appears, was standing on one side of the truck working the controls for the hydraulic lift. They had not yet unloaded the eight galvanized steel cans that were holding waste explosives. Don't know for sure whether they had unloaded the cardboard boxes of scrap explosive pieces. All evidence seems to indicate that the two youngest men were unloading the 104 pound piece of PBX 9404. I had a radio in my office and these communications started going back and forth about there's been an accident at the burning ground. And we had just finished having coffee and was walking out of the coffee room when the burning ground exploded. And the brother of the guy that I was working for, working with, his brother was in that crew at the burning ground. And we walked out and we were looking right at, we were on a mesa and a canyon and a mesa and then the burning ground. And when we walked out, we were looking right at the burning ground, which was all up in the air, scattered out all over that mesa or that canyon. At some point in unloading this large hemisphere, it detonated. PBX 9404 was the most powerful and the most violent explosive known to man at that time. The sound could be heard all around s -site. People working inside their buildings heard the noise. They knew about the burning ground operation. They knew who was working at the burning ground that day. And we heard this explosion and I told him then, I told Eddie Katnack, that has to be in the burning ground. I bought, I took a truck, me and him went down there. And early in that afternoon, there was security guards, policemen and all. And I went down there and ran and I said, what, who's this body laying there? And they told me that was my dad. And of course, all of us knew who had been working, who was working there that day. And his brother grabbed the pickup and took off for the burning ground. And I had thoughts of trying to take the keys out of the pickup, but didn't make it, and I guess that's the best thing that they did. Let him go. He had to do something. Bun Ryan was working in the office building, building 200. When he heard the explosion, he ran out onto the porch of the building. He looked up into the sky and saw the dust cloud and the debris in the air. He was given the assignment to meet the local Catholic priest at the security gate and escort him into the area so that he could perform his sacred duties. So I did, I got a government vehicle and backed it up to the gate and waited for Father Schuler to drive up and we couldn't let him take his civilian car into the area. Yeah. 
So he got in the in the government truck, and I know from being a Catholic that if he's got the sacrament, you're not supposed to talk to him. Okay. But I broke the rule. I said, Father, do you have the sacrament? And he said, No, I understand it's too late for that. But I've got the holy oils that, that they use for the anointing. So we pulled up to the barricade, and Mel Brooks, the group leader, was there, and he said, Brooks said, I can't let you go into the area because that thing, it's still on fire. There was still blazes going. And he said, we're afraid there might be another explosion, so I can't let you go in there. You're going to have to wait. And I remember Father Schuller looked at him and said, I can't wait. And Mel says, well, you're going at your own risk. And he said, he looked at me and says, will you go with me? I said, let's go. So we went running down. I pulled the sheet off of Lujan. So we anointed him, and then we put the sheet back over and went back up behind the barricade to wait for this, these flames to, you know, burn out. Well, sure enough, we found Pacheco. The body of Mr. Pacheco was found on a knoll several hundred feet away. The body of Mr. Lujan, protected by the truck itself, was found a few hundred feet away and the bodies of Mr. Cordoba and Mr. Martinez were never found. I'm sure there was always talk that this particular operation was really not done the way it should have been done. But who was going to stand up? Most of those guys maybe were like me. They had a job and they didn't want to jeopardize it, maybe, by saying something. I made one trip with uh, the group to the burning ground to watch a burn, just for the experience of seeing the explosives, what they did to it. And one trip is all I wanted to make. I didn't want to go back down there again. That's the hottest fire I have ever been around, which doesn't mean much, but that's, when that stuff burns, it you hear it and you know it's burning. These four men did not go home from work that day, or the next day, or any day after that. Those were bad days. They were terrible days for the laboratory, for the S-Site family, and obviously, most tragically, for the families at home. I think everybody was shocked and, and uh, concerned. In a place like northern New Mexico, you know, fairly large place geographically, but relatively small amount of people that live here. It's tough to go anywhere without seeing somebody that you know. So, so it is, as a region, very much a community. And these accidents, one accident, affects the region in this part of the country. Well, I gotta tell you uh, that those accidents sent ripples up and down the community, up and down the valley. Uh, these were people we knew, <laughs> so we were all impacted by those accidents. I'm convinced that it, it went off in my position. Yeah, never hit the ground. Never hit the ground. There was no crater. <clears throat> you know, explosions make craters. Yeah. There was no crater. Explosions and it picked that truck up and turned it 90 degrees. Yes. Blew one that had dual wheels on the on on the rear. It took one of those wheels off and blew it over the fence. We found it down in the canyon the next day. So it was a violent explosion. Immediately after the accident, an investigation team was assembled. They looked at post-accident reconstruction. All the debris was gathered and used to analyze the point of explosion, what might have caused it, the details of the work crew that day, where they had been, the things that they had picked up to bring to the burning ground. All that stuff was investigated and documented and recorded. Within a short period of time, within just a couple of weeks, the accident report was released on October 30, 1959. However, this report was restricted data, and it is restricted data to this day. Many of the details would be withheld from the public. In more recent years, 
segments, significant portions of the report have been publicly released and made available. The details of this secret on the Hill would remain hidden from the public for over 50 years. The laboratory um, and the history committee worked for many years on getting memorials put at the places where these accidents happened because the same general type of work goes on in the same places today. And we wanted to remind people who, who may not have been familiar, maybe they'd never even heard of these accidents and certainly never heard the names of, of these individuals who were involved. We wanted to make sure that they weren't forgotten. These are patriots of the Cold War. These are people who came to work each day to make this nation stronger even working with dangerous materials. We remember and honor these men for the things that they've contributed. We acknowledge that their lives were taken in a terrible tragedy and that much pain and suffering has come to the family and continues with the families but still, we must remember and honor these men for what they, what was taken from them, for what they gave. We put those uh, there uh, with gratitude, looking back to see what had happened before. So we remember them, we gain inspiration from them, we gain knowledge from what has happened. And again, I think that the results are tangible. Look no further than the number of fatalities over the decades. It's been a long time since we've had one and hopefully we'll never have one again. What we've learned from the past is one of the reasons why. If we begin to think of these folks as something other than casualties and we think about them as humans and you know, I don't think work is a negative term in this sense, but to include the families and view them from a holistic perspective is really important. And it changes that tone of them being specifically and purely sacrifices. With this memorial in place, workers today are reminded on a daily basis of the price that was paid so that we no longer put human life at risk to perform operations at the burning ground. The materials were not as well understood as we understand them now. We had learned a lot between World War II and the mid-50s, but uh, and the materials that we worked with were pretty active. There was no such thing as insensitive high explosives at that point in time. And it's in this dangerous world with the backdrop. And so I think that those things, those were all ingredients in what led to these tragic uh, accidents that happened. I never heard the words Cold War. All the years that I, from the day I started until I left Eastside, I never heard the words Cold War talked about. And that was why we were working six days a week, three shifts a day. Explosive scientists, S-site workers today, family members, the general public, we all want to know exactly what happened, what caused the explosion. We will never know. Even with the exhaustive analysis that was done after the accident, we just don't know. As far as we were concerned in looking at the impulse to get it started, that is to put a, to drive a plate into it to start a detonation started. It was a little more sensitive than Comp B, but not a lot. I mean, it wasn't a, a entirely different uh, material from that standpoint. Uh, it had a, uh, one of the important tests that were done on explosives at that time were to drop pieces of it as a result of the accidents, they began to drop it on a sloping surface with sandpaper. And they discovered that it was very sensitive in that way, much more sensitive than comp B. When you combine friction and impact as compared to looking either at friction or as impact as separate insults. And its sensitivity was entirely different. I, I couldn't imagine being at home and, and, and hearing that um, my, my dad or, or significant other 
uh, died that day and, and that, that, at that time they didn't have much information to bring closure to, to that accident and after 50 years of, of wondering or, and you know and passed down from generations. The way that people respond to death, especially tragic deaths, is different in different cultures. I think that the memorials that have been constructed um, for the men who, who died, who were tragically killed in these accidents or incidents, I think that the descansos are really important. I think that the memorials do present a sort of descanso. So the word descanso comes from the Spanish verb descansar, which is to rest. And so descansos, when you see them on the highways, on the side of the road, you know, you don't see those anywhere else except for in New Mexico. Um, and, and they really are meant to be like these resting places, these final resting places. But there's also that sense of tragedy that's attached to them, especially when we see them on the highway. It's a cultural element of wanting to be where your loved one was killed. Wanting to see for your own eyes what, what the place looked like. The trees, the buildings, the road leading to it, wanting to relive through their family members' own eyes what they saw, where they went for that last time. You know, their memories very often would stop short of Los Alamos because they couldn't come to work and see where they worked or anything like that when they were alive. So I think the opportunity to be able to come back to their work locations, especially in a closed area like S site, is, is, is doubly important. This wasn't, they weren't killed on their way to work, they were killed at work in a, in a controlled area, in a restricted area. For memorials or descansos to be set for these men, for their families to visit or for their families to memorialize, I think it also has to be done in an area or a place. It might not be the exact place where the accidents happened, but it has to be a place where the families can return to reflect. The descanso becomes a sacred spot, or the descanso is tied to the sacred spot where the person uh, died or um, where this tragedy occurred. What I inherited two years ago was an explosive safety program that was very strong and robust. I think we've got a community of people that work with explosives that, that just get it, right? They understand. They know what they're working with. They know that they have um, a great responsibility to each other to keep each other safe. The deaths of these four men would change operations at Los Alamos forever. Jose Cordoba, Estolástico Martinez, Sebreo Lujan, and Leopoldo Pacheco. You, you can't go read the report on what not to do. It doesn't exist. They didn't have what we have now. Early work on explosives was done under about a five-page procedure. With the development of the accidents, the PBX, with a PBX, we introduced basically the development of, of standard operating procedures. And at first it was just written that you were to write, uh, to prepare SOPs but continue working because of time pressure. With the second accident, everything was halted until SOPs were in place. The next day was not business as usual. All explosives operations at S site were stopped. The group leader, Mel Brooks, required that written procedures be developed and that he review personally each one and walk it down. This process took six to 12 months to fully bring S-Site back into operation. There was rumor that that was it, that they were gonna, they were gonna close down shop, that it was real heavy that that, that was the way it was headed. And again, there was a few people left and then Mel Brooks, wanting to keep it for whatever reason he had, was able to pull it off. And there was a few months there that things got pretty slow. We didn't do hardly anything. I would say we've had a significant improvement um, since those accidents. And I, because of the importance of what happened and 
that horrific experience that, that everybody had to go through. And the men and women today are absolutely um, working in, in defense of their nation and don't have to make the sacrifice of their life because we've gotten to learn from those mistakes. From, I'm not gonna say mistakes that those men made, but um, we've gotten to learn from the accidents that came because they were working with materials in a way that they thought was safe at the time. We don't now consider those operations safe in the same way they did then, and we continue to learn. So 1956 is the first high explosives accident. A lot of, 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 of work went into examining changing the way that we do things. I think helping to inspire the development of new technologies like insensitive high explosives, figuring a way, a way to develop them and to make them work in the nuclear stockpile. Tell, tell us uh, how, how this accident helps you teach new high explosives workers. So now I'm, I'm an uh, on-the-job training in, instructor or, or OJT instructor for, for new people coming in uh, to become um, HE handler. So now that I'm doing that now, it's been about two years since I've been doing that. I, I've been taking them down to the, the, the memorial plaque and I, and I show them the area. I, I talk about the accident and, and what happened and, and how much HE and, and you know, um, where, where everything was at. And, and it definitely, you can see that it, it affects them and, and just like it affected me when I saw it and so I want to pass that on and, and just have that respect for, for all HE, uh, you know, like it's 9404. I first learned about this story in 2006 when I became a group leader responsible for the burning ground operations. Since that time, the story has been told and retold many times in many settings. To the public, in professional conferences, in workplace settings, and among the families. Mike, Joe, and others continue to share this story within the laboratory. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren whom I've met are also doing their part to keep this story alive. They share pieces of it with one another in family gatherings where it was not spoken of for many, many years. And now they too are starting to share this story with one another. This story never ends. Just as the Sandhill Crane will continue to migrate up and down the northern Rio Grande Valley each season, this story will continue to reverberate up and down the canyons for generations to come. But I think all of those folks took pride in what they were doing and what and and being careful, being meticulous, being sticking to procedures and processes and you know, because you could make a mistake and the mistake could be fatal in that environment. And I think they knew that, and I think they took pride in that. We get to go into buildings now where people have died. Um, go out to the burning grounds. People, st we still burn explosives. We, we, have to, we have to treat waste in a way that's safe for everyone downstream of that waste. And so we have to burn explosives in a place where men died. And the men and women that work here now go by that every day and they see where these, these men have passed away. And it's, it's humbling. We don't want to forget because we respect our co-workers who fell and because we want to get better. We, do, we don't want something like that to happen again. And, and so as a tribute to them, we seek to get better. And the way that we get better is to remember the past. 
The story of this burning ground accident is so big that it's impossible to tell at one time or by one form of media. There are technical details that need to be included in a written form. There are human interest parts. There are the emotional parts that need to be shared by video. There is the, the sense, the feeling of the burning ground itself, the stillness of the air, the power of the sunshine, the color of the blue sky that are very, very difficult to convey. I would like to say thank you to the families for keeping this story alive, for, for providing me with the energy to stay in the game and to continue to dig into the details. I want to say thank you for sharing tender experiences and memories with me. I want to say thank you for your openness. I've met grandchildren who will never have the chance to meet their grandfather and have no way to know him and to love him except for the stories that are shared. Where they worked, why they worked there, what happened to them that day, and good things that came out of this tragic accident. Thank you for being an important part of my life. Thank mm -hmm. you.